Okay. I think it feels easiest if I'm talking to you. Yeah, well, I think so. To it's you. It's an interview. Yeah. <laughs> uh, All right, uh, Andrew, thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. Um, uh, why don't we start, and can you please tell me a little bit about your, uh, your history? Where are you from, uh, briefly about your childhood? Okay, so I'm from Cornwall in England, and I grew up by the coast, which meant that I've always had a, a great affinity for the sea. I grew up surfing and swimming and was in the Surf Lifesaving Club, and so I've always loved the ocean. Huh. And when I went to university, I uh, decided to take up scuba diving. When was that? That was in, hmm, what was it, 1989, I guess. Okay. Um, so I learned to dive in the north of England in winter, oh in my. rivers and quarries. Uh -huh. um, and um, even though on my first dive, I think I maybe saw one fish and uh -huh a few leaves and things, I still fell in love with diving. Yeah, you're wearing a, a dry suit? Uh, no, actually, I couldn't afford a dry suit. I was a poor student, so I had a semi-dry suit, uh -huh. which was uh, extremely cold. <laughs> okay, so uh, that was in approximately 89, and you learned to dive. And then, did you, uh, obviously, you moved away from, did you say Cornwall? Mm -hmm. Okay, what happened then? Yeah, so after I left university, I went um, traveling around Southeast Asia. And I ended up in Thailand and um, started to uh, do some diving in Thailand and, you know, going from diving in the cold waters of Cornwall to diving on a tropical reef in Thailand, I was completely blown away by the coral and immediately hooked onto tropical diving. Right. And that was in, was that in 89 or early 90s? So that must have been in, shall I just tell them to stop fiddling around yeah, over there? Yeah, I think it's kind of distracting. Yeah. I, I Permisi. Permisi. Jangan dibikin klip 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 atau apa, karena ada tanya jawab dan nanti harus mulai lagi ya. Okay, okay just sebentar dulu ya. Kalau typing tidak apa-apa, cuma yang lain. <coughs> no, it's it can be one of those things you hear it later, right? And it's annoying. <laughs> well, but the interview may turn out very well. In all yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's start over then. Uh, I mean, not not the whole thing, but so you you went to Thailand after university and you fell in love with tropical diving. Yes. And uh, w when was that? That was uh, in the boy year. That was. So I guess it was around about ninety two, ninety three, um, that I first started diving in Thailand, and very quickly I I decided to train up as a dive master. Um, and so I worked as a dive guide for a few years in Thailand and ended up managing a shop there, okay. becoming an instructor. And then I started traveling into um, Malaysia, worked in Malaysia for a while as a dive instructor, worked in Indonesia for a while. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so I had a general progression from Thailand down to Indonesia. Indonesia. Following the diving, the diving got better and better as I went. <laughs> Do you find that's true that Indonesia perhaps has the best diving in the world? I think Indonesia has definitely some of the best reef diving in the world, really incredible uh -huh. di diversity uh -huh. and huge range of different diving experiences. Uh -huh. um, all right, so were you, uh, when you started diving in um, Indonesia, were you, you were working as a professional diver? Yeah. Were you on a liveaboard? Um, I first started, actually when I was working in Malaysia as a dive instructor, I met up with another English dive instructor and we decided to come down to Indonesia together and he was a sailor so he wanted to teach me sailing and I was going to teach him surfing mm -hmm. and do some diving along the way. Um, so we started working off in, in dive schools but um, we met up with an American chap who just built a, uh, a liverboard. It uh, wasn't quite finished and he didn't have anyone to run it so we went into business together and then we started running a liverboard business. Okay, the three of you? The three okay. of us. And then um, that was what year? Um, approximately. Approximately, that was 97, 98. Okay. Okay. We started doing that. Okay. And where was it out of? Where was your liverboard, bi uh, liverboard based from? We were based in Bali. But in we Bali? Did okay. In Bali. But we did trips all the way up to South Sulawesi. Um, and actually we did a trip as far as East Timor. But we used okay. to do trips out to Komodo all the time. Okay. And 
yeah, I did yeah. that. We did that for a couple of years, uh -huh. and then he decided he wanted to do something else. So we, we split our business, and myself and the other English guy brought our own liverboard, uh -huh. and we continued to do these trips for another couple of years. Okay. And when did you start exploring the uh, Raja Ampat area or the South Raja, Southern Raja Ampat area? So we first came up to Raja Ampat in 2002. Uh -huh. So I just sold my liverboard and a buddy of mine had just finished a new one that he just built. So I managed that liverboard and we came up here together and started exploring the whole Raja Ampat area. And at that time there was there was only one resort here, a very small resort in the north, and only one liverboard that came here occasionally. So it was right in the very beginning. So it was almost total wilderness. Total wilderness, yeah. completely virgin dive sites. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'll get to the island where you founded uh, Misool Eco Resort in a minute, but did there come a time when you started diving this particular area or, uh, where, where we are right now. Uh, yeah. For example, did you discover that some of these reefs and go, oh my gosh, mm. that's an incredible reef? Yes, absolutely. So when we when we came out here, a lot of the diving we were doing was exploratory. Um, mm -hmm. There was a few dive sites that we'd heard about mm -hmm. and got names and positions of, but most of it was just exploring. Like, oh, that looks like a good reef. Uh, look at the current. Let's go yeah. jump in there and check it out. Exactly, that's right. So Magic Mountain was one of those sites. Oh, was that discovered? Early, early on. Yeah, that's right. So, how did you find that? So, we looked on some old nautical charts, mm -hmm. and in around about that area, not exactly where it is, there was a marking that said in 1972 there was a shadow reported by a ship. So, it wasn't a confirmed reef or anything. So, on a beautiful, calm day, we sailed out into that area, and I climbed right up onto the crow's nest on the top of the mast. And we just drove around and around in circles until eventually we saw it. What, the uh, Magic Mountain? The Magic Mountain, yeah. Okay. And as soon as I jumped in, there were manta rays there cleaning and knew it was an incredible dive site. So was that one of the first of the famous dive sites that you discovered around here was Magic Mountain? Yes, probably, okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, and how long did you continue to explore this area in a liveaboard before you started thinking, hmm, I might actually uh, found a resort here. How, how, long did, how long did it take you to come up with that idea? So I started thinking about a resort in the beginning of 19, uh, 2005. Uh -huh. um, so then I'd been on liverboards for five or six years and was a bit tired of the boat life. Um, and I saw there was an incredible opportunity here. Mm -hmm. So absolutely world-class diving, oh, yeah. you know, pristine wilderness, low population density mean, means low pressure on the reefs and the local people were very positive about tourism developing here so uh -huh. I saw there was a great opportunity and so from the beginning of 2005 while we were doing the liveaboard trips I took those opportunities as we were sailing around to look at different places different locations for the resort. Right and how do you pronounce the name of the island we're on right now? Missal. No this island. Oh Bat Bitim. Bat Bitim? Bad bit them. Okay, and when did you think, oh, Bat Bitum is a um, candidate for a resort? How did, you, how did that come about? Um, so I've always loved Missile, the diving in Missile area more than anywhere else in Rajampa. So, south of Missile? Yeah, or? south Missile, okay. so the area where we are now. Okay. Um, and that's because to me it's I mean, the whole of Red Jempat has beautiful diving, but in Missile you have incredible sea fans, incredible soft corals, as well as all the hard corals. And that sort of, the soft coral colors for me is just really special. So, I mean, I had my eye on Missile as my favorite place. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at the different possibilities for a resort location. So it needs to be stunning, stunning location, really beautiful. Uh, needs to be protected from storms, needs to be really close to the best dive sites. That's like Magic Mountain. Like Magic Mountain. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of key. Uh -huh. And so there's a few factors I looked at and I had a couple of different options, but this one was definitely the best. Uh, had you discovered other dive sites after Magic Mountain before you started working on? Uh, yeah, lots of dive sites. I mean, we, we're always exploring. So when Real we... Rock. 
That's right. Yeah, um, a birthday cake. Uh -huh. There's a whole bunch of so, so a whole bunch of ones. A lot of those were discovered early on before you started building uh, Missoula Eco Resort, uh, the resort here. That's right. And uh, when you were traveling around in a in a liveaboard or in a boat. That's okay. right. So, sorry. Well, okay. Well, just explain. You know, explain in your own words uh, how you just how you started off. Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, let's build a resort here on Bitbottom and uh, how does uh, 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 your wife figure in? Where does she enter the equation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, how do we start? So Marit and I met at the beginning of 2005. Mar Marit's your, your wife? Marit's okay. my wife. Uh -huh. We met at the beginning of 2005. Uh -huh. How did you meet her? Uh, she was, she had been taught to dive and become a very close friend of a good friend of mine, we instructed together. We were both dive instructors in Malaysia. Uh -huh. And so at the beginning of 2005, when I just started getting the idea for the resort, I went to Thailand. She was working in Thailand. We met up in Thailand and I sort of floated this like, crazy idea of a resort, which she thought was completely crazy, but uh -huh. she thought it was a good idea. Okay. Um, and so we started from then working together on the project. And so, we did all the fundraising together and writing well, the plans for the I resort. Know that, I know this is kind of personal, but uh, did the, the 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 business aspect of it precede the romantic aspect, or the romantic, or did <laughs> they come at the same time, or how does that work? I, you don't have to answer that if you don't want. Yeah, to. no, that's okay. No, the romantic aspect started first. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. And didn't end with the business aspect. Okay. Well, congratulations so far. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's start on, okay, gee, uh, first of all, how did you pick this island we're on, Bit, bit Um So, I, it was a really beautiful location. I love the fact that it has this bay in the north, it feels really cozy. Yeah. Um, but then there's also a beach on the south, so it's got two different, completely different aspects. I love the fact that it's literally a stone's throw from some of the best diving in the world. Literally. You know, literally a stone's throw. That's really get, great. I know that guests appreciate not having to take really long speedboat Absolutely. rides. Um, and yeah, it's just a really uh, beautiful place. So, so you, you basically almost custom designed your own little island paradise. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it's true, isn't it? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I read someplace that this had been, uh, been a shark finning operation or there was a shark finning operation. That's right. Why, so why don't you explain what that is Okay. for people who may watch this that don't know what a shark finning operation is. Right. So the first time I ever stepped foot on this island, there was the leftovers from a shark fishing camp and there were dead baby sharks floating around in the water. So shark fishermen, they'll camp out on the island for a few months. They'll fish for sharks. They cut the fins off and then they'll dry them on racks. The fins. The fins. Um, and then once they've got lots of them, then they'll take them and sell them to a trader and they're sold normally to China. Well, what, do, what do they do with them, the shark fins? They make shark fin soup. So okay. shark fin soup is kind of a delicacy in uh -huh. China. It's uh -huh. more actually a status symbol. So oh, that, you're, that you can afford to eat shark fin soup. Yeah, so traditionally shark fin soup was very expensive. Uh -huh. And so only the wealthy could eat it. And in China, for example, when you get married or when you have business meetings, it's important to show that you have wealth. Mm -hmm. And one way of doing that is serving shark fin soup. Well, were there shark, uh, shark fishermen here at the time when you discovered Bitbottom? No, they weren't on this island. They had already left the camp. They weren't from Missile. They were from outside the area. Um, they'd already left. Uh -huh. But on some of the islands nearby, there was active shark finning camps. So. You, you found this, this island paradise that had all the, the criteria for your, your island paradise and there were basically a, a bunch of dead baby sharks here that had had their fins cut off. Is that correct? Yeah, so okay. pretty shocking. Okay. And then I'd read something about uh, you and Marit swimming ashore or something like that. Is there a story uh, where that happened? That's on your website. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the story is only that it was too shallow to get the boat in. Mm -hmm. So we had to jump off and swimming onto the beach. Is that, is that the beach where the water cottages are? Yeah, that's just the beach here yeah, by the restaurant. Okay. All right. Um, why don't you kind of summarize uh, 
how the construction of the resort occurred. Uh, I assume there was a lot of fresh water on the island at the no. time. No, 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 <laughs> none. No fresh water. So one of our biggest challenges was the fact that there's no fresh water on the island. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing and a curse because it means that none of these islands have villages on them because there's no fresh water. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the ecosystem and it not being overexploited or damaged by humans, mm -hmm. that's a great thing because mm -hmm. the islands are not ripe for villages to mm -hmm. spring up. Mm -hmm. But when we're building the resort, obviously it was a huge challenge because apart from needing fresh water for cooking and drinking, we all also need it for making concrete. Oh, yes. So we can't use salt water for concrete and of course you use a lot in the construction. Okay, so how did, uh, why don't you uh, give me the one or two minute version of the construction of the resort. Yeah, okay. So our goal when we um, were building the resort was to have as least impact as possible. Um, on the, the island? Yeah, on the island and on the environment. Okay. So our main building material is wood. So we brought our own sawmill. So it's a, a two-man operated sawmill and we started off cutting up all the driftwood. How did you get a sawmill onto the island? Just on a, a transport boat? or? Yeah, on a small wooden cargo boat. It's a very compact one that folds up onto a trolley. Does it work by gasoline or how does it work? Yeah, it's, it's got a, a gasoline motor um, and a big blade like this, circular saw blade. Okay, so, so wood is your main construction material. You bring a two-man sawmill yes. and go ahead. So we, um, we only use sustainably sourced wood in building the resort. So what does that mean? So in the beginning it was all driftwood. Mm -hmm. So all the islands were covered in huge driftwood logs. Mm -hmm. So we milled those and used those. Did you know anything about how to mill wood when you came here? Uh, no, we had a short course when we brought the uh, sawmill that lasted about three hours. <laughs> but one of my partners when we built the resort was a, a German carpenter. Okay. So he had lots of skill okay. in building. Right. So you sort of had a carpentry expert. Yeah, that's right. So after we finished using all the driftwood, we found out about other places around the area where, for example, local people had chopped down trees to make a fruit plantation and they left the trees just lying in the forest a number of years ago. And because the trees are hardwood, you know, they can lie on the forest floor for 10 years and still be in perfect condition. So then the local community leaders give us permission to go and take those like naturally fallen or previously cut down trees. Okay, at that point, did you know how to speak Indonesian? I could speak pretty good Indonesian before I started because uh -huh. of my time on the liverboard. Uh -huh. um, but how, how many different Indonesian, uh, do you speak more than one Indonesian dialect now? No, I, mainly, just mainly just Indonesian. Indonesian, a few words of other ones, but okay. there's there's more than 300 languages in Indonesia. 300 different languages in Indonesia. Distinct languages, well, yeah. Because the uh, human and linguistic diversity is a component of biological diversity. Mm, so. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, you, you outreach to community leaders and, mm -hmm. and I assume made friends with some of the leaders and That's said, right. hey, hey, here's what we're trying to do, and they were yeah. supportive. That's right, yeah, the okay. community were very okay. supportive. Now, did you enlist workers from the local community? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So most of our most of our local workers come from directly from the communities around this area, uh -huh. and we did lots of training in carpentry and English language training, so people could work in restaurants and other places. So, uh -huh. okay. And uh, how long did it take to build the resort? It took us two and a half years before we opened. So we opened in October two thousand eight. Um, but really we weren't finished then. We opened with eight cottages, the water cottages, um, but none of the villas were built, so we've built them as we've gone along. Well, was there an architect that, that, can, that designed the beautiful walkways and the water cottages? And, and I've, I've heard about the elaborate way that the ceiling of the um, restaurant. Uh, restaurant was built. Who, who, yeah. who learned how to do all that stuff? So the restaurant roof is an old European design, it's called a Mandela roof. So uh, the, the German carpenter, he learned about it in his studies, mm -hmm. um, but he never built one, which should have been a warning signal because it was devilishly hard to get up. Right. Um, we didn't use uh, architect for the whole plan, 
but um, a good friend of mine is an architect and so we consulted on something, some different aspects. But generally it was just us sitting around together in the evenings figuring out how we wanted the place to look and drawing plans and changing plans and changing them again. And during all these many months, if not years, of construction, where were you living? And where were the workers living? Uh, in temporary accommodation on the island, so for a long time just under a plastic sheet Mm -hmm. on a raised wooden floor. And then you would have uh, transport boats bring in fresh water and food uh, for everyone. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a lot of the fresh water we got from a nearby island, about 20 minutes away, uh -huh. um, and there's a hand dug well back uh -huh. at the, you know, back through the forest. Uh -huh. And we would then go there with a small dinghy and fill up 200 litre drums, bring them back and use those. But the food was brought in by a small cargo boat every now and again. Okay, and did you um, did you uh, acquire investors in the resort? Yeah, that's how, right. How did you how did you find them? I don't want to go into too many business details, but I'm just yeah. curious as to if someone else wants to build an island paradise, how might you advise them to do it? Yeah, <laughs> how would I advise them, or how did I do it? <laughs> well, why don't you tell us how you did it? Because it worked. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the initial lease on the island was, you know, done with my own funds. But after that, I started to look for um, shareholders or investors in the resort. So who did you lease the island from? For, from the local clan leaders. So they're the official owners of the island and the rights for the fishing around here. So it's not from the government, it's from the local people. The clan? The clan. Yeah, the okay. clan. Uh, do they, they are, uh, are they in a... Do they have their own nation? Are they a tribe? Are they a clan? How, what, do you, what, what is a clan in uh, uh, South Raja Ampat, Indonesia? It's a, it's a very large extended family group that have the traditional rights to the area. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not really a tribe, you know, so in, in terms of one village uh -huh. could have four or five really big families and then not so small families. So uh -huh. it's, a, it's a big family group. Let's take a, a brief break. Okay. I'm going to check my batteries. Yep. Okay, hold on just a sec. Okay, so at some point you um, got the resort up and running, and mm -hmm. it, 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 its its business purpose was to provide some of the best scuba diving in the world to clientele. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there's, so there's two things really for the for the purpose of the resort. One is to do exactly that, to give the best quality diving in the best diving in the world to our guests. But also the vision of the resort is to provide a funding tool for the conservation that we're doing here. So the original concept between myself and Marit was actually not to build you know, such a nice resort. The original concept was to build uh, a conservation center with a little bit of accommodation to support the, the sort of research work but actually what we found is that in reality, the operational costs, the logistical costs are so high that you need a big, res you know, I mean, we're not a big resort, but you need quite a high-end resort to be able to support that, that work. Okay, so the, the original idea was not to make money on a scuba diving operation. The original idea was to do research and uh, promote conservation. And also to yeah. have a, uh, you know, customers to come and enjoy. Mm -hmm. well, personally, I can say it's the, some of the best, if not the best, scuba diving in the world. Uh, so why don't you explain um, the scientific research that's being done here? Mm -hmm. You can mention any employees you want to, mm -hmm. and also, uh, well, let's start with the no-take zone. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what the no-take zone is and how it came to be and how it works yep. now? Okay, so the, the local clan leaders or community leaders here have rights over the fishing in this area. Um, and so when I came and started looking for a place to set up a resort, at the same time I had an idea to lease a big area of the sea um, and base, in effect pay for those fishing rights, those exclusive fishing rights, but then not actualize them, so to create a no-take zone. And No-take zone meaning? Uh, yeah, can't fish there. Uh, no fishing zone. Mm -hmm. 
So in the local area, there's a, a pearl culture farm, and they've done the same thing. So they've actually effectively leased big bays, and they put the pearl lines out in the bays, and nobody can fish there. Right? People can pass through, but there's no commercial activity. So they created a de facto no-take zone, in effect. Mm -hmm. So I had the same idea to do something like that. So when I leased the island, at the same time I leased an area that's about more than 200 square miles of no tick zone. Is so that expensive no to pay people uh, to, to not fish? Yeah, I mean you have to obviously uh, make it more attractive for them than selling those fishing rights to say the shark fishermen. So uh -huh. yeah, that's what we did. So well, what difference does it make if there's a no tick zone? So what? You know? Makes a lot of difference to have well, a no tick zone. Can you explain that? Yes. So not just here, but globally our seas are massively overfished. So most of the seas in the world are overfished. And what tends to happen is, uh, one, or one of the biggest things, is all the big fish get fished out. So for example, why is that important? That's important because, say, a one-year-old snapper might produce 100,000 eggs. Mm -hmm. A three-year-old snapper produces a million eggs. And a 10-year-old snapper produces 100 million eggs. So the bigger fish get, they become exponentially more productive and so they help to build those fish stocks back up for both for fishing and for diving so creating no take zones where fish can get big they can reproduce they can produce lots of young makes the area really special for diving but also those young fish and those eggs wash out with currents into the fishing grounds outside and they make the fishing grounds better they, so they become food for various no, they grow up outside into large fish which uh -huh. get caught by the fishermen. Uh -huh. So the, the science behind it says that for any fishing ground, about 25% should be no, completely no take zone, so no fishing. And then what happens is in the 75% that's left to fish, the fishermen catch more than they would if they, catch, if they fish the whole area. So is what you're saying is that the no take zone mm is almost almost like a little experiment in what could become sustainable fishery for for the planet absolutely yeah, yeah. there's there's now a big movement globally um for people to or governments to create no take zones and so. there's been research on this there's been lots of research yes absolutely have, have you been talking to any of the researchers uh, um i've talked to lots of different scientists we work closely with Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy that have done a lot of scientific work in this area. Um, and something that they've done together with the Indonesian government, uh, specifically the Rajampat government, is to create a series of marine protected areas. So they're not all uh, no fishing areas, but they're big areas and they are then zoned into different usages. So one will be traditional fishing, so for example, hand line fishing only for local people. Other areas might be uh, aquaculture or mariculture, like the pearl farm. And then there's other areas like what we've created, which is a complete no take zone, no fishing zone, protected area zone. So interesting, interestingly enough, in, in Indonesian language, the area that we have, they call a food security zone. Oh. So that sort of sheds light on one of the benefits is globally we're overfishing our seas. Um, so rapidly, the scientific community are, are screaming at governments to say, we have to stop doing this, otherwise it's a food security issue. So if you have a really well-protected no-take zone and the government messes up and the area outside is completely overfished and degraded, at least you have an area for that fish stocks to come back and replenish right. the other areas. Sort of a safety net. It's a safety net. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I just want to add something because yeah. you mentioned the through flow. Yes. So well, some well, hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> Got another question about that. Well, no, 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 because that was in a separate conversation. And okay. so the people that are hearing this, uh, uh, why don't you explain what the, through f the, the Indonesian the through, through flow is to anybody that will be watching this on the internet? Okay. <laughs> so as the earth spins, the Pacific gets pushed up against the Philippine 
the Philippines and uh, Papua New Guinea. So it's actually about a foot higher than it is on the American side. Right? So, so that would be the Pacific Ocean's like a foot higher than the Indian Ocean? No, the, the, the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. uh, against the Philippines uh -huh. is a foot higher than the Pacific Ocean okay. against the, the US. Okay, so it, it, it's actually higher over there in the uh, Western Pacific. Yeah, okay. and that's because the Earth's spinning right. and the, the water on top of the Earth moves okay. slightly slower than the Earth, and so it slightly gets pushed up. Okay, okay. It's right. a, it's so only you got higher water over there in the Western Pacific. Yeah, okay. that's right. And so what that means is you've got this incredible amount of water that's pushing to get through between the Philippines and Papua New Guinea, and so it forces through this through flow, which is called uh -huh. the Indonesian through flow, of water through Raja Empat, and then it goes across and it hits Sulawesi, and Sulawesi almost joins underwater with the Philippines in a ridge, okay. and then it forces that water down and it goes down through Indonesia and out through the straits in Komodo and Bali and Lombok. Into the Indian? Ocean. Yeah, that's right, into okay. the Indian Ocean. Okay. And so the important thing for Raja Empat, Raja Empat is so rich and so diverse, and you have this constant current of water pushing through Raja Empat and carrying that coral larvae and fish larvae through to other places in Indonesia. So they actually think the Raja Empat could be very important for other reefs in Indonesia that have been damaged in order to repopulate them. Uh, so it's incredibly important. Uh, so just to kind of recap, you have the, the, the Western Pacific, I assume it's also higher than the Indian Ocean. It's almost mm. flowing downhill Correct. through Indonesia, mm. washing all those nutrients, and I assume also the upwellings from the Pacific and all that organic material and fish eggs and mm. coral kind of flows and bathes Indonesia and including Raja Ampat and that's the Indonesian through flow is mm -hmm. one of the reasons why this area is so incredibly that's biodiverse. Right. That's okay. right. And then your no take zone mm -hmm. uh, seeks to restore that biodiversity to its its natural state. Yeah, okay. that's right. And then I'm just summarizing uh, the no-take zone not only restores the biodiversity, but also is a model for, for sustainable fisheries mm. globally for the 21st century. That's right. Okay. So how uh, you have this no-take zone that's 200 square miles that you've leased from the, um, the clan. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you enforce it? So we, um, to enforce the no-take zone, we set up a ranger patrol. And so the rangers are people from the local communities, from those clans that have ownership. Um, and we, they, they stay on three base camps in three different areas in a no-take zone. Okay, so the rangers have base camps. Yeah, the rangers okay. have base camps, they have patrol boats, and they go out on a daily basis to look for people illegally fishing inside the no-take zone. Okay. Uh, and what happens if they find people illegally fishing? So if it's someone from the local community, we work closely together with the community leaders. Mm -hmm. And so they actually have a, a Papuan legal system. So then um, the community leaders will call in the person who's fishing, call in the rangers, hold a court session in the community. Um, and then they can put out fines themselves. So depending on the situation, that could be a, a financial fine, it could be community service. But Aside from that, we, for more serious infringements, we work together with the Marine Police. Well, who are the Marine Police? So, Marine Police is like, the, like normal police, but uh, for the ocean. Well, do they work for a certain clan or government or...? Uh, no, so the, the Marine Police are an official government organization, just like regular police. What um, government are you talking about? Indonesian government. Indon okay, the yes. Marine Police are the uh, yeah. Marine Police of the Indonesian government. So you work with them. That's right. Cooperate with them. That's right. So we have two or three Marine Police on our patrol all the time. Uh -huh. So that means that if we get uh, big boats from fishing coming from outside, fishing in an area, we can actually arrest them and take them to back to the capital of Rajempat for processing and put them through the and, court and system. And I assume the Marine Police, do they have uh, weapons of some sort? Yeah, the Marine Police are armed. So, so they can arrest mm -hmm. a commercial fishing boat. Yep, that's right. Now, have you uh, recently, have you caught anybody illegally fishing? 
That's right, yeah. So a few days ago, they caught uh, a boat fishing for sharks and rays. Uh -huh. So they were fishing with a gill net um, that was about two or three miles long. The, the net? The net. And so they come down into uh, the furthest reaches of a no-take zone, um, drop the net down, and they drop the net down at night. And so they were fishing at night. Anyway, the patrol came out and caught them. And then uh, first thing in the morning, pulled up all the nets and took them to, arrested them. Now I've heard that if you're sh uh, hunting for sharks and rays, the mm -hmm. penalty can be somewhat severe. That's right. So um, back in 2010, uh, we spearheaded an initiative to lobby the Raj Empat government to create a shark and manta ray sanctuary. So together with a, a U.S. organization called Shark Savers, we started a petition. We got close to 10,000 signatures. Uh, we got letters from uh, the government of Palau, of the Maldives, um, of Guam. And we took that to the regent, the head of Rajempat, and made a, I made a series of presentations. And actually the basis for my presentation was that the economic benefits for the local people and for the government of protecting manta rays and sharks vastly outweighs the economic benefit for fishing for them. So I tried to make them th look at um, this charismatic megafauna as, a, as an asset for the area. And okay. so after that, they created um, the Red Jampat Shark and Manta Ray Sanctuary. Charismatic megafauna being a very uh, large kind of attractive sexy animal to look at that's that right. draws in tourists yeah like a manta ray yeah exactly or so, a beautiful shark so there's there's been a whole bunch of scientific studies and surveys about what divers want to see and how much money divers bring into the economy so for example in the Maldives there was a government survey where they looked only at shark diving sites mm -hmm. And they counted the number of sharks, they counted the number of dollars that came in, and they worked out that every single grey reef shark was worth 33,500 US dollars per year to the economy. Per, per shark? Per shark, per year. So, you know, the same shark, if it's finned, for example, is probably going to be, you know, 50 to 100 bucks, you know, at sale price. And the mm -hmm. fishermen, they don't even get that, they get a fraction of that. Okay, so uh, briefly, what, what international organizations, NGOs, or governments uh, do you work with? So we, we really have a collaborative approach to what we do. So we work closely with Conservation International um, and the Nature Conservancy that both have, do a lot of work in, in Rajampat and in Indonesia. But we also work with um, other organizations like WildAid, well, it's a U.S.-based organization. They do a lot of work on enforcement and also reducing the consumers. So uh, media work in China to reduce the number of people that eat shark fin soup. So our first patrol boat was a joint collaboration between Wild Aid and the resort to fund mm -hmm. that first patrol boat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, briefly, uh I uh, attended Calvin's lecture on the manta rays, mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating. Mm. What scientific research are you doing here, along with your uh, sustainability models and your uh, uh, conservation initiatives? What, what research are you doing? Okay. Uh, so one of our main projects that we're doing in this area is the Missile Manta Project. So that's a project that focuses on mainly on one of our key cleaning sites, which is Magic Mountain. The that famous Magic Mountain. The no, famous Magic Mountain. <laughs> That's where manta rays, both oceanic and reef manta rays, come in to be cleaned by small fish. Um, so there we do, uh, we set up a database for IDing the manta rays. So by the, the markings on their belly and on their back, you can, uh, it's like a fingerprint. So every single individual is different. So you can ID them. So we're creating a database. Um, and we're also doing satellite and radio tagging. So then we can track their movement and see where they go and what their behavior is and things like so that. So they might go out of a no-take zone and go to some That's place right. where someone's going to kill them. 
exactly. So one of the one of the reasons we do this, and one of the reasons why it's so critical, was highlighted around the time uh, we and other organisations were lobbying the Indonesian government to make manta rays nationally protected. An importance was that lots of people in the government were saying we don't need to have a national ban to protect manta rays because well Raja Empat has a ban and Komodo has a ban and that's fine because they're the main tourist areas for diving but what we were able to show through the satellite tagging is the manta rays travel really long distance and so you have to have a national ban otherwise um, you know the population in Raja Empat get killed as soon as they swim outside yeah, okay, we can take a break here. I know, I'll just turn this off. Yeah, uh, yeah take your time. <laughs> yeah, because we can edit. Yeah. Uh, well, this has been, uh, this is uh, going well, and okay, I don't want to take, i got to refocus here. Once you get comfortable, oh, and sorry, what I'm yeah. going to ask you now is, and you can think about it, is w what would you like to say, uh, even though I haven't asked you about it? Right. Um, uh, assuming somebody watches this and I do a yeah. good job editing I think they will yeah. um, uh, Andrew uh, well I assume before we I asked you my, the, my last question I assume it, it, it provides a lot of satisfaction to give other human beings the incredible experience mm. of diving here I mean, that, that's got to be a great yeah. feeling yes, and, sure. and you have a fantastic <laughs> staff yeah um, but is there is there something else that you can think of? You don't have to think of anything. Is there something else yeah. that that you would like to say uh, sure. in this in this interview? Okay. So uh, one of the things I should mention is that um, in 2010 we expanded our no take zone. Mm -hmm. So the the original no take zone was 400 plus square kilometers. We then created a new one um, a bit further out in some islands called Daram. There's another 400 plus square kilometers. And then there's a connecting corridor that has very, very limited uh, fishing equipment allowed in that area or fishing techniques. And so in effect, nobody fishes there. And that whole area now is 1,220 square kilometers of protected area that's patrolled on a daily basis by the rangers. So it's a, it's a really significant area. It's about the same size as the five boroughs of New York mm -hmm. or something like that. So that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, I guess the other thing is, um, you know, our great hope with the resort is to create a sustainable financing model for conservation that is um, both, you know, gives our guests an incredible experience, you know, incredible high quality diving experience, um, but generates enough revenue to fund all the conservation that we're doing, so running the patrol and things like that. Because I think then it's a very powerful model to be replicated in other areas. I mean, imagine if every single dive resort in the world, even if they had one or two miles of reef in front of the resort protected and patrolled, then what would have is hundreds of thousands of miles of reef actively protected on a day-to-day -day basis, which would be an incredible way for us to c protect the reefs. Okay. So... Uh We've been talking about sustainable fisheries globally, mm -hmm. that mm. you're working on a model for yeah. sustainable fisheries, and what you're also now talking about is, I guess, recreational diving mm -hmm. being operated uh, in a way that promotes sustainable biological diversity. Yes. And it, beca it becomes a global practice where if you're not doing that, it's kind of like mm. not cool. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And is that true? Sometimes some of the dive operations just are operating in places where people fish. And, and Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, to me, it's always seemed incredible how, I mean, I only know of, you know, I could probably count them on one hand, other operations I know that have no take zones. Out of all the different operations all around the world that I know. So to me, it's always seemed incredible how you know, business owners don't see the reefs as their greatest business asset. I mean, it's very clear to me, even if I didn't care about conservation at all, or wasn't motivated by protecting the reefs, I would be motivated because that's what brings people here, you know. And what we've seen here since we've been protecting the area with our patrol 
is the, the biomass of fish has increased dramatically. So in 2006, there was a study by a conservation international scientist and he went all over Reg Impact looking at the fish biomass in different areas and he studied some sites here inside our no-take zone and we invited him back in 2013. He did the same study and the fish biomass right in front of the resort had increased by 350 percent. So really wow. staggering. So that's our asset, you know, that's so it's not just a theory. It's, it's not just a theory, yeah, yeah it's, it's been empirically, it's empirically proven, yeah. Awesome. Uh, anything else you want to say? That's it, I think. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll say on the, on the film, thank you so much for your time, and uh, that'll be it. Great, okay, thank you so Andrew. much. Well, I really appreciate that you know, you're motivated.